everybody to another Michael Roberts Talks to uh, Zoominar session. Uh, this uh, is an opportunity for us to discuss different issues relating to Marxist political economy, Marxism in general, in particular to what's happening in the world economy and of course in this current COVID-19 pandemic uh, crisis. Today I'm very happy to be discussing with Professor Murray Smith from Brock University, Ontario, Canada, uh, where he is a professor of sociology and has written a number of books on the question of Marxist political economy, and in particular, uh, The Law of Value and its uh, relevance to the world economy and uh, events now. Uh, his latest book is, in called, is called Invisible Leviathan, which I do recommend everybody take the opportunity to read because here Murray outlines the basic, not just the basic ideas of Marx's law of value, but also defends Marx's law of value against interpretations, distortions, or differences in relation to that. And Murray today, I hope, is going not only to develop some of the arguments he presents in the books, but also uh, to put that, to try and put that in context, the relevance of the law of value in relation to the COVID crisis. And there are a number of issues where I think we will see that there is quite a lot of relevance uh, for the law of value. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to uh, Professor Smith so he can tell us more about this. Okay. Thanks very much, Michael. Thanks for uh, doing this series of interviews. I find many of them very interesting. And I'm really happy to be able to contribute to the series. Uh, so what I want to do today, as you mentioned, is talk about some of the major themes of my book, Invisible Leviathan, Marx's Law of Value in the Twilight of Capitalism, uh, some of its more distinctive or unique features, um, contributions to uh, Marx's political economy, uh, but also to, as you said, related to the larger problems of the world, and in particular, of course, what we're going through uh, right now in what I'm calling the 2020 crisis, which is a kind of combined crisis in, in a certain sense. It's a very unique crisis because it obviously has a dimension which has a natural origin. <clears throat> um, as we all know, uh, the, the so-called novel, novel coronavirus. But well, there's lots of talk about how the novel coronavirus combines with various comorbidities in individuals, uh, individual health problems like lung disease, uh, emphysema, uh, heart disease, high blood pressure, and so on. What is not seldom, which is what is very rarely talked about, is the comorbidities, the social comorbidities or social determinants. Uh, of this pandemic and how those social determinants have actually magnified the impact uh, of this coronavirus, this unique novel coronavirus, and allowed for the development of something we call COVID-19, which is actually a disease that doesn't afflict everybody that is infected with the virus, but does um, obviously affect some people very severely. So in talking about those social morbidity, morbidities, I think we have to recognize that a big part of those social morbidities stem from the kind of society in which we live, the socioeconomic organization of our society, the governing principles uh, of our division of labor, what gets prioritized economically within contemporary capitalist society and why. And to do that, I, th I think, Properly, we have to go back to Marx. We have to look at his classic analysis of the capitalist mode of production, his contradictions, and what he calls his laws of motion. 
And we have to recall that, you know, really from, from the outset of this discussion, that Marx's basic purpose was in undertaking, in undertaking his whole critique of political economy, his analysis of the capitalist mode of production, was to show scientifically why the capitalist mode of production, like all previous class antagonistic modes of production, has an historically limited shelf life. That is to say, why and how, how capitalism is subject to recurrent uh, periodic crises and why ultimately it becomes an obstacle to the progressive development of human capacities. We really should add today that what Marx called the laws of motion of the capitalist mode of production have actually become ominous threats to human survival. So what I try to do in my book is to delve theoretically into what might be called the crowning law of capitalism, of the capitalist mode of production, which is the capitalist law of value. And I then proceed to discuss two corollary laws discovered by Marx, namely the general law of capital, capital accumulation and the law of the tendency of the rate of profit to fall. The book argues that all three of these laws are not just theoretically plausible, but actual and compelling, and that the law of the tendency of the rate of profit to fall a much contested law is also empirically verifiable. So the argument goes something like this. I argue that Marx's theory of labor value and his law of value involve three central postulates. The first of those is that the source of all value within capitalist economies is living labor, and in particular, living wage labor. And that new value has to be conceived uh, as dual in nature. One part of that new value goes towards uh, the wages of the productive workforce, success, productive labor within contemporary capitalist society. And the other portion of new value is of course appropriated by the capitalist class by virtue of their ownership of the means of production, distribution and exchange. The second postulate is that value exists as a definite quantitative magnitude at the level of the capitalist economy as a whole. So value is not just some sort of subjective thing. It's not a relation of people to people. I'm sorry, people to things rather. It's not a relation of things to things. It is a relation of people to people. It is a social relation. Um, and I believe Marx is committed to the idea that this magnitude is determined fundamentally within the production process. It is not produced, it is not created in the, the realm of exchange, in the sphere uh, of exchange or circulation. It is entirely produced within the sphere of production. However, of course, the distribution of that value between classes and between uh, different elements of the capitalist class and so on uh, is determined through competitive processes that occur within the market. The third major postulate is that the social substance of value is what Marx calls abstract labor, which uh, he contrasts with the concept of concrete labor. Uh, that the measure of this value is socially necessary labor time, and that its necessary form of appearance is money. So in my opinion, these three ideas underpin Marx's entire kind of indictment, if you like, or critique of the capitalist system, uh, and in particular, his theory of crisis, both the crises that we associate with so-called business cycles and also long-term systemic crises that manifest themselves as a loss of system-wide dynamism. Uh, and an increasingly irrational and destructive behavior on the part of the living agents of capital, that is to say the capitalist class. So at the beginning of the book, I offer the following prognosis for 21st century capitalism, which I'll just quote from, I think. Global capitalism with humanity in tow is now facing a triple crisis. First, a deepening structural contradiction of the capitalist mode of production one manifested as a multi-dimensional crisis of valorization. 
That is to say, a crisis in the production of surplus value, which is the very lifeblood of the profit system. Second, an acute crisis in international relations stemming from the fact that the global productive forces are bursting the confines of the nation state system, whose individual units continue to address their gravest problems in primarily national ways. And third, a growing metabolic rift between human civilization and what Marx called the natural conditions of production, the ecological foundations of human sustainability. Together, these interrelated crises suggest that we have now entered a twilight era of capitalism, one in which humanity will either find the means to create a higher and more rational mode and order of social and economic organization, or in which decaying capitalism will bring about the destruction of human civilization. Now, the coronavirus pandemic and the ensuing economic collapse that we're living through right now, I believe, confirms this prognosis quite decisively. The triple crisis that I described encompasses a range of social morbidities, or if you like, underlying social pathologies or conditions that have played a key role in instigating the crisis of 2020 and in giving it the shape and the depth that it's exhibited. So I, I could go on and talk a little bit more about uh, uh, some of the more, if you like, esoteric features of the book or theoretically innovative uh, features of the book. But I think I'll try to kind of interject some of those into our discussion as it unfolds. So I'll turn things back over to you for the time being. Okay, Murray. Well, um, what you've raised is the more general points, which I think is important for us to discuss. Um, you've outlined how Marx's law of value and his theory of crisis has, as it were, three components that you've mentioned. And in some ways, maybe we could discuss whether COVID is now not only highlighting those, but perhaps reaching a turning point. Uh, it reminds me a bit like um, the uh, development of imperialism and the First World War. Have we reached a turning point both in globalization and other things which really are putting uh, capitalism into a period from now on, which can only be reg regarded as degenerating rather than progressive. I mean, you could argue it's been like that for the last century, but maybe this is a particular turning point that we've seen because we had a, a big slump in 2008-9, which everybody at the time regarded as the biggest thing we'd seen since the 1930s. And now it's clear, at least economically, that uh, COVID-19 and the pandemic and the lockdown following is going to be even worse than the Great Recession in the damage it's going to do to uh, not only people's jobs, lives and so on, but even from the point of view of capital, the damage it's going to do uh, to the ability of capitalism to revive and to provide any sort of development of the productive forces over the next decade or so. I'm struck by the points you make about uh, the relationship between uh, nature and value, because this is a big discussion that's been going on here amongst Marxists about uh, whether Marxism is some sort of uh, Prothe Promethean idea, that it's just interested in the industrialization of the economy, the development of productive forces, whatever happens to nature, and Marx and Engels never considered the relationship of humans towards nature, and yet now those are the big issues in the minds of many people, both in terms of climate change, global warming, so the rapacious drive for profit and the development of, of industrialization is leading to a rising temperature and global warming and the, the possibilities of the planet entering a period of serious devastation in floods, droughts, etc., for many parts of the world. But also, as we've seen from COVID-19, that where did the virus come from? It now becomes clear to us that it's increasingly been coming from areas, remote areas of the world where these viruses have been pathogens inside wild animals for probably thousands of years. But because these wild animals have now been exposed to the industrial farming that's been going on, the logging, the development of fossil fuel industry right into the most remote areas of the Amazon and other places, the wild animals have come clean close contact to human beings and have also now been exploited as a sort of farming area in addition to the existing industrial farming we have so that we, these these viruses these pathogens have now 
been able to be transmitted through various animals into human beings. So one of the aspects maybe of the law of value uh, is that the drive for profit rather than the drive for social need, the drive to, or to, to in a way in which nature is harmonized with human developments, because after all we are human beings, and I think that's one of the points that Marx and Engels make, human beings are part of nature, and we're not separated from that. Of course, nature isn't some pure thing, um, <laughs> separate. Everything is evolved, including the impact of human beings on nature, and vice versa, but the capitalism just ignores that. It's only interested in abstract labor, the expansion of value, uh, disregarding all other things. So in a way, this pandemic brings home uh, the import, one of the important features of Marx's law of value, that it is a difference between use value and exchange value, a difference between the drive to meet people's needs and the drive for profit. Precisely. And I think that, that what people often miss about the law of value is that, and the significance of the postulates underlying Marx's theory of labor value is that under capitalism, we necessarily measure wealth in terms of labor time, in terms of, of value, you know, uh, in terms of abstract labor, as he said, and money, money profit in the end is paramount. So the whole of the socioeconomic uh, life of society revolves around the principle of reproducing um, a certain kind of uh, relationship that exists within society between people. Uh, and that is an exploitative relationship that exists between capital and wage labor. So capital's production is not simply the production of use values that can meet human needs. It is also the production of value and it's more specifically the surplus value, which allows one class to remain dominant within society and to prioritize its own agendas, its own interests above everything else. And it imposes this law of value, this capitalist law of value imposes upon society a particular kind of calculus for the measurement of wealth. It's a calculus that leaves out the contribution uh, of nature. It leaves out the contribution of many people who labor in very necessary tasks, very important tasks uh, within society, but tasks that are not recognized uh, within the market economy. Thinking about domestic labor, for example, the labor that's performed inside uh, family households. The labor that goes into rearing children or looking after uh, elderly or ill members of the family. All of this is done outside of the sphere of value relations. And it is not recognized. It's not, doesn't find any kind of expression, for example, in our national income accounts, in our figures for gross domestic product. And just as the contributions of nature are discounted, are seen as externalities, right, in relation to how we measure wealth. Uh, and how we, how we understand our economic imperatives. So this is something I try to bring out throughout the book, and it has, a, I think, a special poignancy right now in, in the midst of this crisis, as you said. The pandemic really does bring a, a lot of these issues into clearer focus, uh, and in a very compelling way. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about some of the more unique features of the current economic crisis. Uh, you and I are in agreement about the centrality of Marx's law of profitability to explaining certainly cyclical crises and perhaps longer term systemic crises as well. Uh, and we're in agreement, for example, that the cause of uh, uh, economic crises under capitalism typically is not some problem of underconsumption or too much inequality or too much exploitation. Uh, as some Marxists, ostensibly Marxist economists, <coughs> tend to argue, but rather that not enough surplus value is being produced in relation to the overall investment being made by, this, by the capitalist class uh, in production. 
and in relation to the overall costs being borne by the system in the reproduction of the social relation, which is capital, that exploitative capital relation, the exploitative capitalist relation to the working class. Um, so one of the things about this current crisis that I find extremely interesting is that even though I think we're in agreement about this too, we were heading towards a major recession in 2020 in any case, a major downturn. Yeah. There are all kinds of indicators of that, which I won't even bother to go into detail on right now. I'm sure you've- Even the mainstream agrees- other talks. Even the mainstream agrees that 2020 is a slump. Exactly, you know, th thankfully I got my pension funds into a safer <laughs> account just in time. I'm planning on, on retiring soon. I did that in November with the expectation that the stock markets were going to take a real hit sometime in 2020. Um, so we're accustomed to thinking of, uh, and this is more broadly the case, not just proponents of the law of the tendency of very profit to fall, but Marxists in general often talk about how the, the form taken by economic crises under capitalism is a crisis of overproduction. The odd thing about this crisis is that it is not immediately obviously a crisis of overproduction. In fact, one could argue it is, an argue, it is a crisis of underproduction, of use values, but also an underproduction, a severe underproduction of surplus value. Because if commodities are not being produced by wage labor, wage labor is not being exploited, there is no surplus value being appropriated. So this is an extremely odd state of affairs, right? Uh, and Marx's law of profitability obviously plays a role both directly and indirectly in explaining how we've gotten here. I would say indirectly we've gotten here because we've allowed a natural disaster of sorts, which is the emergence of the novel coronavirus. We've allowed this to become a pandemic of major proportions on a global scale. When in fact, we've known for some time that such a thing could well happen. And, but even the richest countries, in fact, in many ways, the richest countries are the greatest um, kind of uh, perpetrators well, of this. Victims, anyway, um, they, they failed to be uh, absorb this pandemic and they're supposed exactly. to- Exactly, they, they didn't, didn't prepare for it. Yeah. They didn't provide you know, the inventories, for example, for protective equipment, even for the workforces of their own rich countries, much less trying to prepare for the impact of uh, such a pandemic on a poor country like Yemen, for example, which is now going through a terrible crisis. So I I'd you know, like you to come around and talk a little bit more about the book. And the reason yeah. I will say that is I wanted, I think we've talked about how we see the relevance of Marx's law of value in relation to the current situation in the various ways that you've described. But why, and I think the book helps readers if they do it, to answer this question, but I'm gonna ask it to you anyway. Why is Marx's law of value just so out of order as far as most, uh, the mainstream of the labor movement is concerned, uh, let alone obviously mainstream economics and the ruling groups. Um, but I often, when I participate in labor movement meetings, whether they're of a discussion about an economic issue or in general, the dominant, the dominant, uh, uh, how can you put it, theory, policy, approach is the Keynesian one, uh, mm -hmm. if they're appearing on the left of the party, namely that what we need to do is for, we need to run deficits, we need to control the money supply, we need to spend in order to get the economy going, uh, but we don't actually want to change the general way in which value is created and organized and controlled and owned as Marx describes it and you describe it in your introduction. Uh, uh, and although we go through a series of recessions and slumps and now we have this major situation here, uh, yet again I've been in several uh, meetings only this week and the dominant theme is a Keynesian one of spending, getting the government to spend money, but not changing the social structure of society. It's not something which uh, hits the mind of the uh, activist, the best well understood activist in the movement. Why is Marx's law of value ignored 
uh, in your view, uh, even though it still remains, as we would argue, after 150 years, still the best explanation of what's going on in Kashmir? Well, I think that the answer to that question is pretty straightforward because I think that the Marx's theory of value has revolutionary implications, quite frankly. I mean, I think it, as I said at the beginning of uh, my presentation earlier, that the purpose of Marx's whole critique in Capital is to show why cap the capitalist mode of production has a definite historical shelf life. Uh, that like all other class antagonistic modes of production, it reaches a stage in its development where it becomes more and more obvious that it is constraining the development of human capacities. Or if you like, it's not a fa fashionable word to use these days, but it's, it's constraining the possibility of human progress. Um, and you alluded to this earlier on about, you know, we were talking about um, actually the ecological question. What does Marx mean when he says that, you know, every class antagonistic mode of production eventually becomes an impediment to the further development of the productive forces? There's a Promethean way of understanding that phrase, but there's another way of understanding it as well, which is, I think, consistent with many other things that Marx said elsewhere. And that is we do have to, in fact, uh, restore a sustainable metabolism between uh, nature and what Marx calls second nature, namely human society, which has its own specific laws, but you know, quite distinct from natural laws, but, but laws which are historically specific because of the way in which we choose to relate to each other at a particular point in human history, given the development of human capacities that has occurred at those different points within human history. So we've now reached a stage where, you know, clearly our, our capacities, our scientific and technological capacities are such to solve a whole range of problems that are going unsolved, unaddressed. And Marx could see that already in the 19th century, you know, but at the time, and perhaps he was a little bit too optimistic about the prospects for imminent proletarian socialist revolution back in the 19th century, but he did give us the theoretical framework for understanding how this mode of production was going to develop over time into the future and how it would increasingly exhibit a contradiction between, you know, uh, human capacities and the continued existence of the particular social relations that are characteristic of capitalism, this, this exploitation of, cap, of wage labor by capital, the competitive relation between capitals, um, and so on. These, these fundamental relations that exist socially and economically within capitalist society give effect to the law of value, right? The law of value is not a natural thing. It, it is a projection. It is the product of these social relations. That's, and when I refer to the invisible Leviathan, I'm talking about structure of socioeconomic relations, not just to the law of value itself. I'm talking about social relations underlying the law of value. Why should we measure wealth in terms of labor time? Well, that only really makes sense in the context where some people are not working and they're living off the labor of other people, right? And uh, in order for them to accumulate a great deal of wealth, they have to continue measuring wealth in those terms. And that's through the medium of money, of course, which is the necessary form of appearance of value. Your other question, just briefly, the, there is a, a great attraction to the idea that capitalist crises are caused by insufficient consumption by the working class. The working class has become, is too exploited by the capitalist class and therefore not all the surplus can be absorbed. You know, is that whole line of thinking that goes back very far in the Marxist tradition. Even people like Rosa Luxemburg uh, were exponents of it, although she would not have supported the use of such a theory to uh, defend capitalism or to recommend a more reformist kind of political practice. But, you know, the, the, the key idea for me, though, is that, that capitalism is facing this crisis of valorization, insufficient production of surplus value relative to the overall investment being made 
and the overall process of capital's production and reproduction. And that's been an ongoing problem uh, for the last century at least. And we've had many ups and downs. And, but you know, the price we had to pay to get out of the Great Depression of the 1930s was a horrific one. Uh, if we have to go through another major war in order to restore the conditions of profitability, to restore the conditions of robust capital accumulation, um, I think the capitalists will, will take us there. And if that happens, there's a very real risk that we will not survive as a species. Yes, the, the ecological crisis is extremely acute and extremely important, but I think that the risk of war is also something that we should be very worried about at the present time. And uh, I don't see much of an anti-war movement in, in existence. <laughs> not yet. <laughs> I was going to ask you one more question about the book, yeah. which might be what readers will say. If they read the book, they'll find that you go into some detail in dealing with the theoretical differences with other yes. people who would claim to be Marxists and socialists and even supporters of Marx's law of value. Mm -hmm. And you go into that detail in trying to see what you find faults in their position, uh, inconsistencies or whatever, and you defend a different position as you see it a clear one. Uh, some readers might say, well, this is all a bit nitpicking. Uh, does it really matter? We're all Marxists, we're all socialists. We might have a different view about uh, exactly what the law of value is, but we're all going in the same direction. Uh, can you justify why you think you would have, to, why you need to do that in your book, which you do very thoroughly? Well, I think you do it in your books as well. <laughs> I commend you for that. I think that these differences are very important uh, because they do have very, very significant political implications. Um, so, and the main one, of course, I mean, between the difference between people who are called I would say, I, in a certain broad sense, I'm in the Grossman tradition. In the sense, I believe Grossman was explain one what of Grossman is. <laughs> Grossman was, was, a, was a, uh, a mid 20th century Marxist economist who uh, wrote uh, an entire book on uh, the law of the law and tenants rate of profit, one of the first people to really try to put that at the center of Marx's theory of crisis, uh, after Marx and Engels, at least. Because in the early period of of the uh, you know of the twentieth century and social democracy and even in in the early communist movement, not a lot of attention was paid to Marx's law of profitability, and there are many other theories of crisis that were I think more influential: disproportionality theories, under consumption theories, theories of pertaining to what's called the crisis of realization, which I think is probably the one that Luxembourg was closest to, and all these I all, but all these these theories, many of these theories at least, have in common is this idea that the problem that the system has in reproducing itself, you know, ro robustly at an adequate rate of growth, along for an adequate rate of investment and capital accumulation, and so on, is that there are, there, there are these persistent problems in realizing the value of what has been produced uh, in the sphere of circulation in the market. And many Marxists have, have therefore, some concluded that this was an insoluble problem under capitalism, and others concluded that, uh, well, we can make some progress towards solving this within capitalism, and in the process, build up a you know, strong workers' movement, which will have as its eventual goal socialism. And that was, you know, the, I think, the, sort of the path taken by classical social democracy for a lar uh, to a large extent. They rejected the idea that capitalism was fundamentally irrational. And they, they began to edge towards a position that, that capitalism could be made more rational and more humane with certain kinds of structural adjustments, certain kinds of reforms, often reforms that would also uh, produce a better life for the working class within capitalism, less misery, less unemployment, you know, more security of various kinds. Um, but the, the, to me, the, the history of the last century does not support this idea, you know, that, that capitalism is, can be made more rational and more humane or more given a more human face. In fact, that history to me suggests quite the opposite, that the system has a, a very pronounced tendency towards becoming more irrational. And the reason for that is that, and Marx put his finger on it, 
himself. He said that the progressive development of the productivity of labor under capitalism finds expression in the falling rate of profit, right? Profit, profits fall, the rate of profit falls because the productivity of labor is rising due to technological innovations that on the one hand, at the micro level, help workers, particularly workforces, to produce more with less time, with less effort, but that these technological innovations also have the effect of displacing living labor from the production process. And since living labor is the only source of new value and surplus value, this will have a depressing effect on the rate of profit over time. And what I try to emphasize is that this finds expression not only cyclically, but also in the long term. It has, finds a secular expression, so to say. Um, and that secular expression of the law of the falling tendency of the rate of profit produces, you know, ever-evolving strategies on the part of social capital in trying to counter the profitability crises as they recurrently emerge. Um, so, you know, Marx could not have predicted it, all what all of these strategies would have been. But he does talk about, you know, five major counteracting tendencies for the rate of profit to fall. I believe that there are other counteracting tendencies that the capitalists have deployed over the past century to restore the conditions of profitability, including war, but also ecological devastation. Also, um, we could also cite the uh, increasing reliance on fictitious capital in more recent years. All of these things point to the fact that the system is having more and more problems dealing with this ongoing, and I would argue deepening, crisis of valorization, insufficient production surplus value. And that's exactly the opposite notion to what is put forward by many other Marxists who believe that there's no, there's no problem with the volume of surplus value being produced, you know? It's, it, the problem is that it can't be realized, that a lot of the commodities don't get sold, or they don't get sold at the prices that they should sell at. Right? But what doesn't seem to occur to them is that the reason that there's no purchasing power for many of those commodities is precisely because of the effects of the falling rate of profit. You know, Price, prices have to be sustained by a certain level of value. There's a, that's, the, that's the floor. For the for prices, and if, if values are being uh, lowered, then prices must be lowered as well. And if that those if the prices are lowered, then the profit margin also declines. And this at the macro level, you know, finds expression in the fall in the average rate of profit, and ultimately also, of course, conjuncturally in a decline in the mass of profits, which is often the immediate precipitant uh, of, a, of a cyclical crisis. So th these are very, very different perspectives on crisis. And, and I think they're very, the implications are enormous politically. Well, Murray, you're, yeah, I think the book covers a lot, all these issues that the viewers will have heard from Murray today and, and more. Uh, and uh, there'll be an opportunity, obviously, for, again, anything you want to say in the finish, Murray, or not? Um, no, thank you very much for this, Bob. I really enjoyed it. Good. Well, thanks very much, everybody.